Uh, yeah, if you don't get enough DevOps days here, like two hours away, DevOps days Hartford in a few weeks. So yeah, we're good. So I'm gonna talk about craft as in beer, um, which you might recognize like the cadence of this phrase, and I'll get into it and we'll, we'll explain a little bit more as we go through the talk. So I don't wanna give too much away in my introduction. Uh, we're gonna be part history lesson and part like smashing two ideas together and see what comes out the other side. Um, so this is me, this is what I do. Um, I like community advocate. You may see some folks, like I wrote advocate because the avocado like emoji doesn't work here. Um, but that joke becomes funnier in other languages, like in Portuguese where it's actually advogado for advocate. So anyway, that's a long standing thing there. But uh, here's where you can contact me. I also like to be contacted like Katie. Um, this talk has a lot of ideas that I haven't seen other places. Maybe you can be like, no, actually someone else thought of this first. Um, but otherwise, I'd love to hear feedback on Twitter or an email, uh, whatever people think. Like, I like this idea, or this is ridiculous, and here's why. Um, either way, feel free to contact me, tweet me during the talk, all that sort of thing. Great. So free software. This is where our earlier phrase came from, craft as in. Corda sounds like free as in. Uh, so to understand and level set free software, I want to talk a little bit about the history of software and how we got to where we are now uh, in the current state of things. Because uh, I think when I say free software, like half of you will probably be on the same page as me, and some people will be brand new, but DevOps is pretty big. We probably have some similar backgrounds. Uh, so like in the 50s and 60s, software kind of existed. Uh, it looked a lot different. Uh, it was pretty hard to copyright, like the current order that you punched holes into a card was a weird thing to try and copyright. Uh, and largely, each system was unique. So there was no copyright for software in the 50s and 60s. Um, by 1974, Contu, a government agency whose name I now forget but only remember the initials, uh, argues that software, as far as it represents the author's original thoughts, should in fact be covered under copyright. So it's not even as recent as 1974 before we even started having the conversation. And around 1980, software is in fact defined and added to actual copyright law. Now there are mechanisms in place for protecting your software in 1980. Um, this may sound like familiar times. About three years later, Richard Stallman finally actually leaves MIT Lab, and a couple years after that forms the Free Software Foundation. Um, so it's interesting, this interesting progression. You see, uh, this copyright isn't really how community works, right? Stallman leaves because it doesn't really jive with how He's grown up, right? You're not told when you go to school, hey, you can't share your truck with Sally because she didn't purchase the correct licensing agreement to use that truck, and so you must keep that to yourself. Um, you know, it's not like, hey, I know you brought candy in to share with the class, but they didn't properly purchase the software agreement, so you have to hoard all of it and like eat it in front of them. Um, <laughs> so it created problems even across like departments. If different people wanted to work on projects and you came up with like, hey, I edited the program this way, try running it, you weren't allowed to share that even across departments working on similar tasks. Uh, so free software gets defined. Um, it's not really surprising that uh, it's Stallman that defines all this, but the ideas are it's freedom to run the program as you wish. So you're not able to be restricted to run free software on a particular operating system or in a particular way. You can do whatever you want with it. Free software also includes the freedom to study and change how the program works. So access to source code is kind of a prerequisite for that. Uh, if you can't view the source code, it's probably not free software. Freedom to redistribute copies. Hey, I found that you know, using Apache really helped me get done the task that I needed to get done. Why don't you try it too? That's part of the freedom of free software as well. And moreover, if you've modified it, yeah, I found that bug in that runtime. I fixed it, try this version instead. That has to be key to free software as well. Um, so does anyone know this animal? Yeah, it's a GNU. So GNU uh, is remarkable as the first, we're trying to build the first free operating system. At this time, pretty much everything is commercialized versions of Linux by specific vendors. Uh, so the free software foundation starts the GNU project. Um, what was really interesting wasn't necessarily the software they built, but their effect on current copyright laws. Uh, the problem with just releasing free software uh, under public domain, for instance, is that someone else can change it and now copyright it, and that locks it back into the world of copyright and unable to be distributed. So being the sort of hacker culture we are in the mid-'80s, uh, Richard Stallman develops CopyLeft, or the whole GNU Foundation develops CopyLeft. 
The idea that we're specifically copywriting a work, but making it free and open for people to use, and also stipulating if you change it or use it, you must also release this under a free and open license. Uh, so the GNU GPL is created around this time. Uh, many other open source licenses exist now, but this is when it all starts. That becomes relevant later uh, as Linux is finally released as the kernel that ties all these GNU bits together. Uh, it's a really interesting story of monoliths and microservices if you dig into the history of like GNU and Linux. Uh, one of the commentary is um, GNU is being built as a microkernel. We're trying to build all these pieces that work separately and build together. Uh, and Linux came along and was like, what if we just do everything at once? And they were first to market. Um, yeah. So that gets some popular adoption. It's sort of interesting to note that as it releases around the early 90s, so does the internet get popular adoption. Uh, and as internet spreads and becomes sort of ubiquitous, I mean, I remember the late 90s, like DSL was a thing for your house. You could get megabit connections at home. Suddenly, people are downloading this free to use operating system and spreading this around. It also became popular because of hosting the internet. That's a lamp stack. Uh, <laughs> So at the time, you had like Microsoft and IIS, which can largely host a website on a machine. Or you could run Linux and Apache, and you can run a whole bunch of websites. So if you're a company uh, that might want to host a lot of websites for people like GeoCities, uh, you'd rather use one machine to host many websites than to have 2,000 machines to host 2,000 kind of OK uh, JavaScript Trails websites running for you. So this is what the modern internet looks like. Of the top 1 million domains, 97 of them return, I'm using Linux for an operating system. And the 3% is whatever else is left over. All Amazon EC2 instances are 92% some flavor of Linux. So clearly, like this adoption model has been successful. So again, talking in the early 2000s, we've got uh, the story of the cathedral and the bazaar. Um, Eric S. Raymond, there, I knew I could recall it without my notes. Uh, so Eric S. Raymond writes this essay talking and comparing two different forms of software development. Sort of this old commercial style is much like building a cathedral. A few people get the plans, they sort of know about it and are allowed to work on this thing behind closed doors until it's finally open for the public to use. Uh, where open source and free software is very much like the bazaar, the people that are using it and participating as, as, and building it all have a say. It is really tight feedback loops like, hey, we need an aisle here. Please move further apart. Um, so there's a very clear line between how these th two things are built. Um, and it's not to say that cathedrals aren't a good thing. There are some really amazing cathedrals out there. It's just two different styles and approaches to how we build software. Um, and this was relevant for what it put out there in the world. You might recognize this logo. Uh, Netscape at the time has been built as a cathedral. They have a problem uh, because roughly like 95 or so percent of internet users are using Internet Explorer at the end of the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, they can't give this away because Microsoft's already giving away Internet Explorer and like anti-compete practices aside, it's a real business problem. So partially inspired by the problem and partially inspired by the Cathedral and Bazaar essay, they recognize they could change their build model and include more people, invite the community actually into their process of constructing this web browser. Maybe our code is part of our product. And you have the Mozilla Software Foundation eventually formated, formulated out of that. And of course, that's Firefox today. One of the biggest open source browsers on the web was Netscape, because they decided, hey, let's invite the community in to see what we can make out of this. And there's more than that. It's not just successful software-wise. This community-driven development led to these conferences that we have here. There were install parties. There were like little minor get-togethers or meetups and mentorships that developed in this software world just by putting people close together and starting to build it and inviting folks into that process. Where we lacked this commercial support, folks got together and had these install parties like, hey, anyone having trouble installing Linux? Let's help you out live. What weird problems are you having that someone else may have seen before? So free as in, right? It's not free as in beer that's compelling. Free software isn't interesting because it doesn't cost you anything. And besides, if I offered free beer while more people showed up, you're probably not expecting like 
Trillium or Treehouse to be given out. It's probably like Bud Light. Uh, so there's kind of a com uh, quality connotation when someone says, hey, this is free, free beer, right? You're kind of like, um, it's free, but is it any good? Uh, it's also not a really good analogy because free software is more free as in puppies. Like, here you go, you can take this home and you get to deal with all of the maintenance and cleaning up after it, um, which is more realistic, right? Like, we don't install open source software and expect it just to work magically. We kind of have to use it in the right environment. Uh, so right, it's free as in speech, the common analogy that's used. It's interesting and compelling because it grants you certain rights and certain ways you can use that software, and it brings people together under its banner of freedom. So uh, if I was more clever, I would think, all right, we've got free as in speech, free as in puppies, free as in beer, and I'd come up with some clever like free as in analogy to keep going here. Um, but I got distracted once I got to beer and was like, hmm, I would like a cold one right now. Uh, so let's talk about craft beer. So there's an interesting history parallel here that's it's worth going over. So 1887, there's roughly 2,000 breweries in the US. Those who are keen on US history notice a problem coming on the near horizon. Uh, because in 1920, there's roughly zero breweries in the United States um, because it becomes illegal to manufacture and distribute alcohol. Uh, so the 30s come along, prohibition ends, uh, wars are a thing. So like stuff gets a little bit weird, but it also completely changes the industrial landscape of the United States by the time that beer comes back. Brewing a massive, consistent product that you can market across the country becomes really powerful. So brands like Anheuser, Bush, Miller, Coors, these start to become really popular because I can get a Budweiser here and across the country and it's the same thing. Um, so by the late 1970s, which is now roughly as far from prohibition as we were before it, there are only about 44 breweries. Um, this is the most dramatic number, it varies a little bit, but the highest I've seen is like 100. So either way, it's a far cry from the 2000 we had before prohibition was a thing. And partially that's due because homebrewing is still illegal at this time. It's not legalized until 1978. And we're starting to see a similar timeline here as in 1980, uh, there are about eight craft breweries out there. We've just started to experience what we can do with craft beer. Um, so let's define craft beer so we're on the same page here as well. These breweries are small. They can't produce more than 3% of the US annual beer sales and still be considered a craft brewer. They are independent, so they cannot then be owned more than 25% by someone else who is not a craft brewer. Uh, and traditional, which mostly means they brew beer. Uh, Mike's Hard Lemonade turns out does not count. Um, <laughs> the flavors have to come from the fermentation process and the barleys and the grains and the hops that you use to actually make the beer. Um, it can innovate off that, but it has to have its roots in traditional beer making. So we have some early Brewers, these are some of the earliest craft brewers that existed. Anchor uh, in San Francisco, while around for a long time, really struggled through the 60s until uh, they were purchased and revamped their actual process. And they were supported by uh, Fritz Maytag, whose brewery was his favorite, and he saw them going out of business. He's like, I will rescue this. Uh, New Albion was one of the first home brewers turned sales, right? They sort of inspired generations of people to say, hey, you could make some money doing this thing. You could actually make this your living. Uh, and Sierra Nevada, largely responsible for like quality hops being accessible to home brewers. And this continues, right? The 90s come, and like Sam Adams is a thing, whether or not you feel one way or another, they proved that you could get craft beer at your sports bar. Um, Allagash proved that we liked things other than like lagers. Um, so it, it continues to grow, and you have new and new companies sort of breaking ground and doing interesting things with this product. Uh, Oscar Blue is known for making cans cool again, so. Um, that's sort of interesting. I'd love to talk to you more about those too. Like if anyone wants to like nerd out about craft beer, I'm totally available for that. Um, so roughly everyone in the United States, like the, the it's statistics, so they're obviously skewed, but on average, you're within 10 kilometers of a craft brewery. Uh, this is my little state of Connecticut, and these are the known craft breweries that are around there as of whenever I took this image off the internet. Um, it's probably changed, but there's some saturation here, right? Like this thing is becoming popular. In fact, there are roughly 6,300 craft beer breweries now in the US, uh, up from eight in 1980s. And we're seeing sort of a similar adoption curve here, uh, again, to like what free software did. Suddenly, 
we have this way to talk about what's going on in our neighborhood. Social media is kind of a thing by 2010. Uh, and we have sort of an explosion of craft beer. So if that were all there was to tell, and like, hey, it's a successful business model, you should go start a brewery, it wouldn't really be compelling. Uh, so I want to tell some stories of uh, a few breweries around that I think are really compelling stories that get at why they've been successful. Um, does anyone know Smutty Nose? Cool, yeah, we're close enough that most people know. Um, <laughs> so in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, there's a brewery called Smutty Nose. Um, the owner of that bought Smutty Nose by accident, which is a great story. Uh, so he's already the owner of Portsmouth Brew Pub in town. And uh, there's another brewery, goes out of business, they have an auction for the goods, so he comes out and says, hey, I wanna be here to welcome in someone to the new craft brewing community, offer advice, offer any help, whatever they need, and, and kind of welcome them into the fold. Um, and if you're going to an auction, you should obviously throw a lowball bid in just in case. Uh, and then he won. So now he suddenly went, oh great, I have two breweries now and I need to come up with recipes and labels and distribution models and figure all of this out. Uh, and what happens is all of the employees in the community rally around this. All the photographs on all their beers are taken by a local photographer. Uh, the, the dog from Old Brown Dog was one of the employees' brown dogs that's there. Uh, all the other people are members of the Portsmouth area. And they actually took their pictures and were on the labels. Uh, so it's built really by the community that was there. Uh, Booth Bay is awesome. So Booth Bay Craft Brewery, if you're, I suppose people live in Maine also, but also if you're on vacation in Maine at Booth Bay, uh, it's a great location. Uh, so the owners of Booth Bay bought this area, knew they wanted to build a brewery, and as they're brewing one of their flagship beers, uh, they decide to get everyone involved. They actually have everyone come together and they give out hop plants to the community. And they say, hey, grow these throughout the year. And uh, come harvest season, everyone brings them back. They have a big harvest party. They, they collect all the hops. They have food and beer. Uh, and they brew a beer for the community. The wonderful story is that it happens to be 6.33% alcohol by volume, which is also the area code of Booth Bay, Maine. So it kind of names itself 633. And it becomes their flagship pale ale, uh, brewed actually out of the hops grown through all of the people around there that, that care about it. Um, but what really is interesting is that wasn't the extent of the vision they had. They also have a vision for this public house, and not just a place where we can sell our beer to people that want to drink it, but a true public house gathering where people can get together in Booth Bay and talk about local politics, discuss what's happening with in the world. Uh, I think our country was largely built in public houses. Um, so as they start to build this and reach out for help from the craft beer community, uh, they get responses back from folks like Dogfish Head and Allagash, and they send them actual lumber to help build this thing. And they've carved in the logos from these beer breweries of the Allagash logos and the uh, Dogfish Head logos. And members of the community start giving wood to do this. And they start carving in from whom and where they got all this wood. They literally build the facility on the bones of the community like that have donated and helped make this thing. And now it is a destination where people go with their families to discuss local politics or what's happening in their lives. Uh, and City Beer is not a brewery, they're a beer store, and they wanted to build this in San Francisco like you have a wine bar store, right? Where folks come and can kind of enjoy this one thing. Um, and they were told when they started, you know, there's no way you can have just a beer store, it won't be successful. Uh, and of course it was, but not just because craft beer is successful. Um, what happens is folks come here to drink beer at City Beer, and they bring friends who might not drink beer. They say, you know, what wines do you have available? At that point, they're forced to say, well, I'm sorry, we don't have wine, we only have beer. Um, and that could be the end of the story, but they said, what wine do you like? Like, what do you really like to drink? Someone would say, I, I don't know, a Merlot, right? It's like, okay, great. Um, but what, what do you really like about that? What is with the flavor profile? What do you think of when you drink this Merlot? That's, why, do you, why is that your go-to? And they might describe whatever flavor notes or mouthfeel they have, uh, and they can get the response back, you know, why don't you try this beer? Because what you're describing reminds me a lot of what this beer gives for me. Um, would you want to just try it? No worries and, and see what happens. And the response they got back largely was, I'm so glad you didn't have wine because now I discovered a new thing that I get to be a part of. And I get to go out with my friends and drink craft beer with them and have that experience together. Uh, so the success is not just because craft beer is successful, but because of this inclusion that happens there as well. So how does it all smash together? And I might run over time, so I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna try and go through it and still get there. So 
Um, what I don't like about purely free software and purely craft beer as they pertain to software is we can't always open source everything that we do. For a lot of companies, especially now, like that code is our secret sauce. That's what sets us apart from the competition. That's the difference between doing a side project and having a career and like actually putting food on the table. Uh, and it's hard to measure like barrels of output of code. So like small is a weird thing to talk about when you're talking about output. Uh, so I think there's other definitions and other hallmarks uh, that lend itself to how we can capitalize on that community interaction um, without losing sight of, of who we are. Uh, so I think passion is one of it. I'm realizing my captions are, go oh, that's awesome, sorry. <laughs> never seen a change. Uh, so passion, I think, is a big portion of it. Um, it's not just like I need to get these lines of code into meet quota, but I actually care about the work that I'm doing, the quality that it produces, and the impact it has when it releases. I think innovative tradition is a good way to capture that traditional roots with the way that we look towards the future. Um, you know, in the, in the beer example, like Treehouse innovates. They make new stuff that hasn't been done before, but it's still rooted in the traditions of beer brewing. Uh, this whole talk isn't a whole cloth new innovative idea. It's rooted in these ideas of free software and craft beer. And DevOps isn't a whole cloth new thing. We said, hey, what if we agiled our ops, right, and apply these practices in a different way? And what else does that look like? Um, openness and sharing is key. This, for one, going to meetups, sharing what you do, um, or think of other companies like Twitter's or the Netflix's that are out there that don't open source everything they do, but they say, hey, we thought of a new way to host our CDN. Here's how we do it. Or hey, we thought of a new monitoring process, or we thought of a new way to test systems by introducing chaos on purpose, and here's how we do it, and here's the code to do that yourself. Uh, that's key hallmark of craft software companies. You open and share what you can that doesn't set you apart, that sort of lifts everybody up at once. Uh, and obviously, it's that community involvement. Uh, it's not just coming out and sharing what you do, but it's also inviting folks in to help build that process as well, um, making sure you're getting feedback from your communities, involving them in the actual build process. And this is where the staying power really happens. When you give folks that banner to wave of, I helped build this, and you give this identity to carry around, suddenly people start caring about what you do a lot more. Like a hallmark of we have built some interesting community is when as a company you do something and people get angry about it, right? Because they care deeply about what you've been to that point and you're sort of changing their perspective on it. Um, that's really important and caring about that impact you have and caring even about your local non-tech community. I think philanthropy is a good hallmark of craft software companies as well. Um, we want the people around us to be lifted up from our success, not just to stand above the crowd. Um, so those are the four key takeaways that I have for that. I think these are the hallmarks of some new, some ways of developing software that can kind of include all of us, whether or not we get to work at an open source company or not. Um, I'd love to get feedback, so I don't know if I have any time. I think I have like one minute left at the time. Two minutes, awesome. Um, so if people have like one question, I might be able to answer it. <laughs> Otherwise, there's another slide that has how to contact me more and I can get feedback everywhere else. Potentially. Okay. So you're making the comparison between craft software and craft communities, kind of. Yeah. Um, the general idea is that as you scale up, everything goes to crap. Like, <laughs> people don't like <laughs> cores, people don't like uh, the bigger breweries for the most part. So like, to, to further this analogy, how do you see like enterprises adopting DevOps? Is that gonna be like the same thing or can we do better? Um, I, I think we can do better, right? I don't think we have to make the same mistakes that have been made historically. Um, besides the fact, I think taking an idea of, of flipping it from a different perspective, right? Like beer is kind of this big conglomerate thing that's happened for hundreds of years. Software being relatively new, I think, has the age and the ability to make better choices. Um, I would love to talk more with people that want to like talk about this idea of can craft apply to enterprisey type businesses. Um, it's something I struggled with having a good idea about, like, does GitHub count now that they're owned by Microsoft? I think GitHub does a lot of really good, important things for the software community. Um, I, don't know, I don't know where that, that compiles. I would love to, like, roll these ideas over more. Cool. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, yeah. Hello. Oops. Wow. This, is, this is the picture slide, by the way. If you want to find this later, it's all here. Um, and are we out of time, I'm assuming? Is We're the out of time. Yeah, Perfect. Is